Hey, what's happening, everyone? Um, happy New Year or New Year's Eve, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, got a show for us for the Saturday slate, the 12 gamer with uh, just shit contest. But, you know, we're here to talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> Joined, as always, by uh, my pal Gavin. What's going on, Gav? What's going on? Yeah, 12 games and a ton of soft pricing. There's only 600 people in play. So let's uh, let's start breaking this down. Yeah, and we got a special guest here, Michael Bedard. Um, he's got a podcast. I will let you talk about it, Micah. What's going on, man? Yeah, what's up, Steve? Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, Mike the Bedard dog. Having college football is really into it, and then college basketball, I'll be honest, you know, talk about the pricing and slates. It's just been kind of tough to put out some content, but Steve, you've been crushing it there. So excited to get into this slate. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, his podcast is called, I believe it's Miked Up with Dard Dog. Yep. Uh, it's on, um, you know, Apple Podcasts and everything. You can search for it. Hopefully he does more podcasts soon because I do like listening to those. Um, well, since we have 12 games, we should just dive in. Uh, the first game, noon Eastern, <laughs> West Virginia at Texas. You know, we got some stuff to talk about with Texas, uh, you know, the – the news kind of broke this morning. It hasn't been confirmed yet, but uh, Marcus Carr leaving the program, maybe Christian Bishop too, um, hasn't been confirmed. But you know, usually something like this isn't you know someone making up stories. Uh, what are your initial thoughts on this, Gavin? Yeah, it's perfect that this is the uh, first game of the slate because we can get this uh, this, this Chris Beard segment over with. But. I mentioned before, like, you know, he basically just had a, a Ferrari drop in his driveway in the form of Marcus Carr for the transfer portal. And uh, his his reaction was, OK, I'm just going to take a C4 and just blow this whole thing up, actually. I mean, you want to talk about one of the most dynamic, you know, playmakers, shot creators, shot makers in, in the country. And he wants to run, you know, an offense that's predicated for, you know, the 1940s. I mean. This is such a, this is so bad for Chris Beard. It's it's really hard to articulate, and it's more from a, a rigidity perspective. You know, look, Chris Beard, great career at, at Arkansas Little Rock. Can't argue it. He turned a shit program into a 30-win, you know, school. Um, but Texas Tech, look, I mean, he had the, the two good years uh, with the Elite Eight and the runner-up with Player of the Year, Jared Colbert. Outside of that, really one of the 10, 5, 10 best coaches in the country. I mean – this is like, you know, Bill Self has been around the block for a while and finally realized, okay, I can't play Remy Martin 20 minutes as the seventh man and think that he's going to stay. And Chris Beard is kind of just like, you know, my way or the highway. And when you have the resume of Bill Self or, you know, someone who's been in the sport for a long time, who's paid their dues, and not that Chris Beard's a bad coach by any means, but boy, this, this, this has me hot my blood is boiling over this just because we had such high expectations for texas we thought that car was going to be kind of the straw that stirred that entire drink yeah. and got all those pieces to connect and work i mean and chris beard just said no nah, fuck it i'd rather just keep teams to 50 and and play crap offense so here we are you know it yeah, doesn't know I mean, if he's going or not but it, it's it's bad so micah they're down to 357 in tempo only behind virginia yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on the car thing and in on Texas in general? Uh, this is this is a shit show. Like when I first heard that Carr was going, you know, like think about it, like what Carr did last year in Minnesota. Pitino let him do whatever he wanted, right? And like now, like Gavin said, you're going to put him into a you know high profile team, and he's going to run it and have to do everything Beard says. Like forget about it. He wasn't going to do that. <clears> there's <throat> many guys that like. What are you going to do? Like these guys, they brought in, you know, Disu, all these guys that like were taking a bunch of shots. And now you're going to tell them, okay, you guys are going to get like 20, 25 minutes a game. And like uh, Steve, you're talking about, I'm going to put Brock Cunningham in the starting lineup, you know? So um, unbelievable. I think it, it's just weird from like, this is not a beard team. Like he doesn't need these guys to, you know, obviously at Mac McClung, right? When he gets to transfer him. But like, did he think he was going to do the same thing with Carr? Like, I think McClung was good to play in a system. But now you got Carr, who, and if he leaves and Bishop leaves and Timmy Allen, I mean, I, I, I yeah, it's a shit show there. And, uh, you know, especially yeah. for the best purposes. I mean, at least McClung was playing, what, 32 plus a yeah. game? I mean, I've got Carr at like 65% of the minutes. He's starting Devin Askew over him, yeah. playing Brock Cunningham 20 a game. And, you know, it's just tough for me to see how this goes well. Um, you know, Gavin and I have, 
been kind of texting about it for a couple of weeks now. It's like, when is he going to figure the shit out? Um, you know, there's, there's only so long you can dick around with your rotation until, you know, the guys start to get pissed off. And this is exactly what, you know, we've been talking about. Um, you know, they've, they've, they've lost their only two tough games, you know, Carr didn't play well in either of them played like dog shit in both of them, I think. Um, but you know, he's, he's trying to run 10, 12 guys out there, you know, at, at, at some point you have to cut the rotation, you got to stop playing Askew, you got to stop playing Cunningham. Um, we'll see what, what actually happens with Carr, but it, you know, it doesn't seem good. Uh, so let's, let's, let's kind of dive into the game then, uh, for the DFS side, uh, West Virginia on the road here. Um, I'm not very high in West Virginia overall. Uh, Gavin, why don't you give us your, uh, first take on the, uh, on the, uh, salaries? Yeah. So you got a game total open at 122 and a half. You got Texas already bet up a point, shockingly enough from eight to nine. Um, and you know, part of, we, we texted about this initially last night. I said, you know, I, I'd be shocked if West Virginia gets 60 points in this spot. They've just, they won, they've slowed it down a lot this year. Um, it's like, I, th- I believe it's Bob Huggins' slowest team in pretty much a decade. They're pretty much reliant on Taz Sherman and Sean McNeil to make, you know, most of their baskets. The, they don't really get many easy shots around the rim just with Jalen Bridges and, Gabe Osaboyan being uh, kind of more defensive guys. But so, look, when you look at West Virginia, I, I, I can't pay for Taz in this spot just with the game context. Um, for West Virginia, I think it's pretty easy. It's it's kind of Sean McNeil or pass. And I'm not feeling great about Sean McNeil. It's probably a little more of a, a cashy play given the minute floor, the shots that you'll get. But, you know, if he's really going to try and break a slate and, and five or six X, he's probably going to need peripherals that – I don't know if we're going to yeah. be there in a super slow paced game where he's going to be, you know, out physical by most of the guys on, on Texas. So yeah, not, not going to be a game obviously that I don't think anybody on the slate is going to be uh, heavily into for obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, for me, I don't think I'll probably have anyone from this game on either side. Like Gavin said, it, this is going to be a, a rock fight. Uh, there's some questions with Texas. Uh, Micah, what do you think about this game? Any plays for you on either side? And, uh, Talk about the Texas rotation a bit, will you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's an easy pass for me. I mean, I always say Sean McNeil is going to have to put up 30, like, in real life points to like, make a slate or anything like that. So, I mean, at most, he's going to take some shots. But against this Texas team, I don't I don't want any of them. I think the only guy on Texas, like, this is maybe in play, but at least 6,200. Like, you can't, you can't play any of these guys because they're not going to play more than 25 minutes. So, I mean, this one, the tempo-wise, can be easy stay-away game. It'll probably – like Gavin said, like first to 55, 57 wins. So I don't, I don't want any part of this game. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty wait frustrating. till you see what the other, real quick, Steve, wait till you see what the six to seven K forward range looks like. And uh, you'll quickly realize why it's going to be really hard to play to Sue. Probably yeah. impossible to play him in a one lineup scenario. You're probably not getting to him until you're 10 or 20 max, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a loaded kind of area of the cards or, or of the uh, slate in terms of that okay, middle cool. price forward. We can move on to a Creighton at Marquette. Uh, Gavin, why don't you give us the lines? And I think you have uh, a thought on a bet on this game too. Yeah, it opened uh, total 145, open Marquette minus one and a half. Money has uh, come in on Creighton to the you know extent of a half point um, to where Marquette's you know now minus one. And I, I have a pretty good idea that I'm probably going to bet Marquette here in the next uh, couple hours. I don't know why I haven't yet, probably because just the – the first, you know, half point move was their way. But, you know, you got Creighton coming off a Villanova 20 point drubbing back on the 17th. So they haven't played in two weeks. A young team going on uh, for their second true road game, which their first one was at Nebraska, which while a relatively hostile environment, given the kind of geographic proximity, is not a team that you're really, you know, worried about playing at home by any means. Uh, a young team that's probably been patted on the back a ton the last two weeks for kind of what they've they've pulled off beating BYU kind of losing late to ASU, but uh, you know, then, then obviously the Nova drubbing um, Marquette's had a horrible five game stretch coming in here in, in terms of just strength of schedule. Like they lost at Wisconsin by 13. They barely edge out K state on the road by one. They lose at home to UCLA. They lose at Xavier by nine where they were challenging them pillar to post in Cintas um, and then lose to UConn. Yeah, that was you know? good so, 
that is – and they had it close against UConn with about three, four minutes left as well, and then UConn kind of pulled it out late. But, you know, they got a 10-day rest here. Is this kind of a circle the wagon spot finally? You know, Marquette has the 17 toughest strength of schedule. Um, and, look, they're eighth in tempo with, you know, Creighton not only 259th in allowing turnovers versus the Marquette Shaka Press at home, but also 324th in non-steal turnover percentage, which is basically yeah. a measure of unforced errors. And that really is a, is a big, you know, flashing red light to me. Um, I think it's a very typical buy low, uh, sell high spot. And, you know, I think with anything within kind of two to two and a half, probably within a possession, I feel comfortable betting Marquette here. Yeah, I'm with you. I think I'm going to bet Marquette. I think it's a good spot. Um, what do you think of the game overall, Micah? And let's start to dive into the plays on the uh, Creighton side because it looks like the pricing is pretty good, actually, on both sides. Yeah, Creighton never, like, these two teams, like, I mean, Gavin mentioned, like, pricing-wise. I mean, Justin Lewis is probably my favorite player from this game. I think he's really, like, I don't remember him being as multifaceted as he was last year. Like, it looks like he's gotten a little uh, skinnier from last year and more athletic. So, I really like him as a play. Creighton's just tough because they're all kind of priced in the, you know, range where I'd want to play him. But you never know who's going to, you know, break out there. Like, I'm... I'm here or there on Nemhard. I think he's a little out of control. I think he'll be good in a couple of years at Creighton, like at the point. Um, so I'd probably play Justin Lewis from Marquette's side. I think I, I like him as a play. Now I'm Creighton, Nemhard, um, Alex O'Connell. It's funny, Alex O'Connell like, didn't play at all last year, and then all of a sudden like he gets this year and he's playing like 30. I know, he's playing a ton of minutes. Yeah, he's playing 30, 35. And, like, I forgot he was on Creighton last year, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden he came in there. So I, a high-tempo game, I, I'm with Gavin, you know, in terms of, what shock has kind of done this year and got them playing a different style. I don't feel good about playing Tyler Kolek, um, but I think he's decently in play. I think this is going to be one of the fastest games of the slate. So um, I think you could play multiple players from each side, but Justin Lewis is probably my favorite play. Yeah. I think this is a good uh, like tournament game stack game uh, yeah. for sure. We get good pricing on both sides. Lewis under seven K, you know, that's, that's almost a, just a snap call play yeah. for me. Uh, besides that, on the Marquette side, you said Colac. I'm not a, you know, I would, I would rather find a 700 for Lewis personally. Yeah, exactly. That's what um, yeah. I played. You played Colac when Marcel was out, and you got to capitalize on Colac's kind of peripheral yeah. rate, booing his score when he got a little bit more usage as well. And Marcel was out against UConn, so again, that was last game. I think this goes back to the ultimate buy low, but. You know, yeah, I'm probably paying for more sell in this case over Cole, just given kind of his his role in the offense and what he means to that team. Yeah, I do like the uh, Cam Jones kid too. Uh, probably tournament only just because he he's a sh shot only guy, but you know he's still under 4K, going to give you what 25 to 30 minutes in this one probably. Um, on the Creighton side, I think, man, I think like Gavin said, we're probably going to bet Marquette. I. I, I kind of have an uneasy feeling about Creighton coming into this game. You know, I think they could get beat pretty, pretty good here. Um, I'm never playing O'Connell, even though he's going to project well. Um, Gavin, you're a, you're a baby Nemhard fan. Uh, he's, yeah, he's more good. cash than GPP. He doesn't he's, have the ceiling to blow off the slate, he's, but you he's, know, he's probably going to get there. Yeah, he'll be good for what twenty two to twenty six. You know? <laughs> the only thing uh, I'm worried about this game too is the COVID layoff, which I wish we didn't have to yeah. remember this year. But like last year it was a real thing, so I think what Creighton hasn't played in about 10, 11 days, maybe. And yeah. so that is one thing to look at in this game, just from a rust perspective. But I'm not going to put too much weight into it. But it's something that is yeah. mentioned. Yeah. That's a that's a great point to bring up. I mean, with COVID, the teams that have already played, we already have a pretty good idea who's in and out. Keep in mind, these teams that haven't played in two weeks, which are looks like about half the slate, we're, yeah, we, have we're no not, idea. we might not have any idea what's going on with them until, you know, an hour or our lovely college basketball reporting two minutes after. All. You know? <laughs> after a tip, right? Uh, yeah. Well, that, that, that kind of dubbed – dovetails nicely into the next game here which is uh memphis oh, we, we, real quick real quick we, we have to mention cal brenner dude i mean okay cal yeah. brenner is is having a phenomenal year and i think he is one of the three to four guys that you have to consider uh, uh i guess five including justin lewis in that you know mid 6k ish range um <laughs> kind of funny you know per per evan mia i mean cal brenner is 19th in the nation in mvp score 
and wow. seventh in what what's called an indispensability rating. So you imagine if if he's removed from the floor, the biggest net difference in team performance. And now it's a lot buoyed on his his defensive prowess. But you yeah. know, on that indispensability rating, he's in front of EJ Liddell, Drew Timmy, Kendrick Davis, Oscar Shibwe, Ochai Abadi. Like he's been extremely wow. useful this year, getting extended run now that he's got all five of those 12 year seniors gone from last year. <laughs> yeah. I think if he plays 30 minutes here, he could definitely crush at six, five, you know, he's got the rebound, you know, the block rate that can, I can really, uh, I, I don't really worry about Kirk. Either. Yeah. He's sure. Yeah. He's good, but I, I yeah. Not yeah, to yeah. Stop so, I don't know. Actually, I think, uh, Calc's probably my favorite play on Creighton if I was going there. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, Hawkins has this. Hawkins has that crazy ceiling, though, man. So he's got to be in consideration as well. Yeah, Hawkins at seven two. I think I'd probably play uh, Calkbrenner six five before Hawkins. But man, so yeah. So there's a bunch of guys in play there. Uh, not sure anyone besides Lewis for me on like a main team, but just an awesome, awesome tournament game stack game. Um, going in to the next one, this is probably a, a, a terrible game stack game uh, with Memphis, who's been at the forefront of the COVID issues. Looks like they're getting a bunch of guys back, though. Um, not sure that matters for me. Memphis on a 12-game slate, personally, for me, is going to be just a total X out. Uh, you know, doesn't seem like he wants to really cut down. The, you know, he's he started the, to cut down the rotation in that Bama game. Uh, but, you know, um, I don't know. I'll I'll let you talk about Memphis here, uh, Micah. What do you think? Like, how can a team that has Larry Brown – like, what does Larry Brown do at Memphis? That's my question. Like, how does he even stick around? <laughs> Throws the bags around to the – Yeah, like, <laughs> he's just like, you're going to pay me, like, 200 grand. Okay, yeah. Like, Penny is an AAU coach. Like, he coaches high – like, it's just embarrassing, like, what he's done there. Like, yeah, he had a decent year. Maybe if COVID doesn't happen, then he, you know, with those precious teams that he, you know, yeah, tournament. But, like. He even screwed that team up. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. He plays all these guys. I think Jalen Duran's, like, the guy. And, I mean, you don't know off of COVID, like, how many minutes he's going to play. Like, he's a guy who, like, you couldn't argue with me to play him on every slate just because he does have crazy upside. But uh, was he going to get 22, 23 minutes? I mean, especially. Yeah. Off the COVID, I mean, they're a stay away from you too. Like, you, I don't care though if you don't have DeAndre Williams, you don't have Jalen Duran, you can't go into Tulane and lose that game. No, and like they're just in shambles. And uh, I don't know how much longer you put it. And this is tough. It's just like John Thompson the third at Georgetown got like five years longer than he should have, just because you can't fire guys like him. And I mean, yeah. he's a different. Like he's not on Penny status. A lot easier to fire Penny, but um, it's still tough. Like he's he is Penny. But this team, just from a DFS perspective, is just, you know, not there. And then, um, you know, on the Wichita side, Tyson Eddian, I didn't even look at his price yet to see where he's at. But I mean, ETN's probably, still at 4 8. Take, take a wild guess. He's the same freaking price that DraftKings has had him on the last nine slates, and he takes 14 shots a game. And it's just another one of these, like, hello. And I was burned on him on Oklahoma State. But, you know, it, yeah. The better defense still at 4.8. Like, you can't just turn away from that. So he's really probably the only player on. Uh, Wichita, but Penny is just like, and then Monty Bates, we talked about him before, see, like, he doesn't, like, hey, he's 17, I gotta keep saying that, he's 17 years old, but he is, he doesn't know what he's doing, like, on offense, like, what are you doing a half-court set with Monty Bates, he doesn't know what to do, and uh, it's just kind of, it's rough watching them, them beating Alabama, I was high on Alabama to start the year, but, like, that game, when they couldn't do anything against them, was, was kind of scary. Oh, man, that, that game was the worst, I know Gavin and I live bet Bama a couple times, <laughs> and uh, my Hokies lost to this garbage Memphis team too. That was, you know, they they just shot the lights out, you know, out of nowhere. That sucked. But yeah, I mean, you're right on Bates. He's a he's just a garbage basketball player. Uh, he'll get drafted on talent alone. Has no idea what he's doing out there. Um, terrible shooter. Uh, Duran is down to seven two. You know, so his price is down about a thousand. Um, so you could take a look at him in tournaments. And we mentioned uh, ETN, I think, is the only play I would go to on Wichita. Um, Gavin, do you have anything else on this game? Yeah, what do, you, what do you, you say if I told you this was the fourth highest total on the slate? Whoa. Memphis does play fast, so they're yeah, going to pace them up a little bit. They do. Now, yeah. the, the last thing I heard, word for word, was that 
DeAndre, Duran, and Bates may be game time decisions. Yeah, that's what I saw. To me, that sounds like they're relative long shots to play. So we at least have to address what the last game looked like without them. And boy, it revolved around Alex Lomax, Earl Timberlake, Anders Nolly, and then Quinones. Dandridge still only got 19 minutes as a big. Um, but we have to keep that in mind. Like, who really carried the usage was Timberlake, Landers, Nolly, and Dandridge when they were in. Lomax played 33 minutes, took three shots. Now, quick math calculator, one shot per 10 minutes is not somebody <laughs> I want to be playing. If if those guys are back, if all three are back, then it's pretty much, I think it just takes everybody out of one lineup consideration. Yeah. If, if, they're, if they don't play, I think I'm kind of – interested in Landers Nolly to an extent at 5k yeah to an extent yeah, and really. and I almost think that you're playing him as a pivot to potentially ETN who if those three guys don't play he very well could equal ETN shot volume with way more peripheral upside in my opinion so just just kind of one of those things you got to keep an eye on I don't think I'm playing Earl Timberlake at 4-2 even if all three are out yeah, uh, good thing is this is this is in that first window of locks, so we should know before the slate locks who's who's in and out. I am seeing that there's three guys traveled, Gavin. Um, so and practice as well, and they practiced. So now keep in mind, in, this, this line stay is, away. This line has already gone from Wichita State plus one and a half to Wichita State minus one and a half, and looks like they're going to minus two. Yeah. Okay, well let's uh, let's move on to Baylor Iowa State, which I think is gonna be a good game. Um, what do you got for the uh, spread and the totals there, Gavin? One thirty-two and a half total. Um, I think third worst on the slate behind the the two rock fights. Uh, but we got Baylor favored by seven and a half in uh, at Iowa State in Hilton. Yeah, this is uh, it's probably the biggest home game for Iowa State in. I don't know, 10 years or so, feels like. Uh, you know, both undefeated teams. This is, you know, uh, a lot of people are um, saying that Iowa State isn't, you know, real. I think they've, you know, I think they're pretty good. I, You know, they're, they're clearly not, you know, like a top 20 team. But what's impressed me with them is their defense. I, I think they're like sixth or seventh in um, – Effective field goal percentage defense Seven, on right. Ken Palm. They're sixth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they've held their last, what, one, two, three, four, five, six out of the last seven opponents under 60. Baylor is going to pace them up a bit and score. Uh, Ken Palm's got this Baylor 69 62. Um, yeah. I, I actually don't know what to make of this game as, as far as the betting angle. Um, I basically bet Baylor every game and just, I'm just daring them to not cover at this point. Um, Micah, why don't you tell us a little bit about the DFS side? Baylor's tough just because they got so many guys that are good. They kind of eat at each other, I think. Yeah. And this is what DraftKings does. It's like all Baylor guys are out. Like Kenyo's got the highest price player on the slate, almost 8.6. And I don't think you can play him here. <clears throat> it's Iowa State's a pretty good defensive team. He, they're not. You think of Iowa State, you think of fast paced run and shoot like with Steve Prom um, before, but yeah, they're pretty slow playing team. I think, you know, I like Holzelberger, what he's done there. Rockington, I think, is kind of, I think this is a game, like, it's going to be a really good game. I think, and a lot of these times when you have a slow paced game, like Baylor loves these kind of games. Like, you can you look at the Nova game, like, they will, they'll play slow with you. You want to play half court possession basketball, they'll play with you. So, I think this is a lot more good in real life game than a good in DFS game. And I don't, I don't think I really want to play anyone. You know, Tyrese Hunter and Brockington get a ton of usage. But once again, you saw what Baylor did to Nova. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is going to be a good game just in terms of – like people aren't going to see a, a 75 to 80 game or something here. But I think it will be a good basketball game. But for DFS purposes, Baylor would be in play if they were priced a little bit more appropriately. But I think all those guys are kind of priced up there. Yeah, they're they're kind of in the same boat that Texas is, right? You know, they've, they've, they've got a lot of mouths to feed and they're priced – like they're the top option on the team, but they've got five top options. Um, I worry a bit about Iowa State turning the ball over here, Gavin, against uh, Baylor. I don't think that um, Hunter plays very well here in this game. I probably wouldn't play him. The 
freshman just against this team of just uber athletes on Baylor. This is probably a stay away from me for DFS. Gavin, what do you think overall and uh, any place here? Yeah, you know, this is this is a tough spot for Iowa State. I, I just I can't have the onions to bet them. After what we saw with Nova, you know, being led by a freshman guard in Tyrese Hunter, as much as, you know, I, I love that kid for the, the future of Iowa State and being a point guard. And then, look, Isaiah Brockington has been incredible this year. We also saw Isaiah Brockington be a middle-of-the-road Big Ten guard and, you know, taking, I mean, as big of a step up uh, in competition as you can take with Iowa State having the 345th uh, toughest strength of schedule to now play in. Uh, a team that is top five in both offensive adjusted, offensive and defensive adjusted efficiency, top ten in yeah. turnover rate, and and offensive rebound rate, top twenty five in two point offense and defensive percentage. It's there's the only bad stat is that they don't shoot free throws that well. Which I'll tell you, at seven and a half, maybe uh, if if you are looking to get to Iowa State, what kind of gets you the, the cash there if, if they can't get the free throws late, but. The main thing to discuss with Baylor is the rotation. Um, you know, with no Matthew Mayer last game, with Cryer, I believe, being cleared to play, but still being a DNP uh, with them playing. Uh, I can't remember if it was Alcorn or Nichols or one of those bums right before conference play. <laughs> but, you know, I imagine Cryer plays here. Yeah, same. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Mayer does. Um, yeah. I don't and think he and does, they, they kind of repriced up Soshin, you know. This is yeah, look, I'm not it's sure one it of the worst totals <laughs> in a spot where all the Baylor guys are pretty damn expensive. Like, you know, maybe you get a Kendall Brown or a Cryer and GPPs in case they, you know, get 20 to 25. But are they going to get, you know, potentially a quarter of Baylor's points if Baylor only gets to 80? I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to see that. So probably a full yeah. pass to me. If you really want one of my disgusting gut plays right here, Tristan uh -oh. Eniwara. Oh no, it, Tristan Enuara. He he got a little more minutes against uh, whatever <laughs> bum team they played last time out. He's so much more athletic, able to actually do something against the stout Baylor front line um, than who's our boy George Condit or whatever. Yeah, Condit um, sucks. He just can't stay on the court. <laughs> I don't even. I don't, oh, because I mean, yeah, there you go. Yeah, because Condit. I mean. But anywhere at least gives him a chance to to defend inside and have some athleticism and some switchability. So we'll yeah. see. That's about all I got from this game. Yeah, I I just see this game being like Baylor seventy, Iowa State like fifty five or something like that. Um, no plays for me on on either side. I agree with Mike that you know the prices are just too high for the uh, for the Baylor studs. Uh, let's let's move on to Nova Seton Hall. This is a spot where if Seton Hall is healthy, I would definitely bet them, but they got some COVID issues going on. We saw that really impact them in the Providence game. What was that, Wednesday or Tuesday? Yeah. Uh, they just, you know, they had to play four guys like 38 minutes, and they just got tired at, at the end of that game you saw. Um, Yetna got us the double-double at surprisingly low ownership to me. Uh, I thought he was a lock and load on that slate uh, i would project him for what 36 38 minutes here gavin um, you have to he's got to be one of the highest minute four guys on the slate barring fouls i think yetin is an awesome play at 6-2 nova man they they're they they play slow but their defense has not been up to snuff this year with that jre in there um micah why don't you take this first since i'm kind of rambling here on seton hall yeah, I mean, you talk about Nova. They're just, you know, you got exposed against Baylor. They don't have, like, as good as Justin Moore is, I'm a, I'm a Justin Moore stand for sure. Like, last year I played him anytime I could. But he's just not one of those guys that necessarily creates his own shot. He's good at coming off screens. And your go-to scorer. So, like, they've kind of struggled this year. It's not your typical Nova team. They really miss a, uh, Robinson Earl from last year. Uh, Eric Dixon is kind of a sneaky peer. Not necessarily sneaky because he's 5.3. He's not like a dumpster diver cheap play. He's had a good last couple games. He's another guy that just needs to stay on the floor. Um, so I don't mind Eric Dixon here. And uh, you mentioned on the Seton Hall side, you know, Jared Roden. Also, I was before I was looking earlier, you know, and I was pretty sure it was maybe two, three years at least. Bryce Aiken's been playing since 2017. Like Bryce Aiken can stay healthy. Is the Perry, <laughs> he has been the Perry Ellis. But 
I think the same thing. At 3.7K, he's going to get a bunch of minutes here too. Um, and, and Nova is not their you know, best defensive team. So um, I think this will be a good game. I think it's a CBS game actually. And, uh, you know, on the Villanova side, I think really the only guys you can consider are the high price guys, but like seven, six and seven, seven for more, like seven, seven for more. Like I played him all the time last year. He's like 5,800 or so. Like yeah. he just, he doesn't put up peripherals. He's going to, like they have great floor. They'll put up 20 points in Gillespie, but like, I don't see much of a ceiling from anyone on Nova. And then you mentioned Yetna. Um, it just depends. This is another game. I think to kind of see who's going to play and maybe, because I think there's a pretty quick turnaround for them. Uh, to come back, yeah. especially if they're short staff. So um, I, th- I definitely think getting that Aiken and uh, Roden on the Seton Hall side. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this is – it's just like when you fade Gillespie and these Nova guys around AK, you just feel so good that they're not going to bury you with like a 50-point, you know, game. Uh, so I'm fine fading that. This is a, this is a tough spot. I mean, Seton Hall got a little bit embarrassed against Providence. They're coming home. You know, they don't have Ike – and Gavin, who else was out? Was it uh, Samuel? Ty- yeah, uh, Tyrese Samuel as well. Yeah, I mean, this is just a tough spot for Nova. If Seton Hall was healthy, I would definitely bet Seton Hall here. Um, DFS wise, I think it's Aiken and Yetna and pass for me. What do you think, Gavin? Before we move on to the next game. Yeah, you know, first, you know, they don't say embarrassed. Come on, they were shorthanded against Providence. <laughs> And and they made it a five point loss because they outscored them twenty four sixteen in the last ten yeah. minutes. But they Evan were down Willard's like twelve. Pretty, pretty late. Evan Willard's game. been pretty vocal about just how upset he is about the Big East and the the ten day not moving to five days, and which leads me to believe that he probably wouldn't have his panties in a wad if he was only missing those guys for one game. Even though you know, sure, they don't want to miss him for that one game. I, I imagine that they probably don't come back. Um, and, and I, I wanted to, I was thinking about betting Seton Hall regardless of if they didn't play. But the two main factors that kept me off are, one, the obvious turnaround um, with being short-staffed. And two is that we saw Seton Hall play a ton of zone defense to try and save the legs of their guys, knowing that That's a good point. you know three four guys were going to have to play 30-plus minutes uh, for them to even have a chance. And if they play zone against Nova and Nova – Nova's due for some disgusting positive shooting regression. And yeah. if they're playing against a team that's playing zone and you're holding a Seton Hall ticket, you, you could be dead four minutes into that game. That's true. Yeah, like Syracuse. Syracuse, they just shot lights out. You know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Nova's, if they play zone, they're going to shoot 40, 50 threes <laughs> in this game and hit 20 to 25 of them. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's a weird spot for me. Let's – uh. Let's move on to Providence to Paul. Uh, Gavin, why don't you take this one first? I know that you, uh, I think you're on the DePaul side here. Yeah, you know, you you want to be on DePaul. Um, I, it's, I think Providence is good. I think Providence is getting a lot of positive pub with having more quad one, have like three more quad one yeah. wins than anybody in the country. Um, we got to find a play. spot to fade them for sure, but it might not be here. Yeah, DePaul without David Jones, and, and keep in mind, you yeah. know David Jones is is six six. He's not he's not a, a true big because they do have surprisingly a, a respectable collection of of big men and kind of what Nick on Gendez turned into on the defensive end. We get to Muir, not a nay, a nay spottings, whatever you want to call him, and and God forbid <laughs> Brandon Johnson shows up um, yeah. at, at some different points. So. Even without David Jones, you know, they got some usable pieces at least to slow down kind of that front court heavy attack of Providence with Forkler and, and Watson. Um, and the difference is Providence doesn't have a, a Javon Freeman Liberty uh, on their team. So yeah, I, I, I want to get to DePaul so bad because I, I want to fit <laughs> this Providence team. But and, and if it was no David Jones, I would I would be firing blindly and excessive amount. But man, it's just a, a tough spot, you know? Yeah. Uh, DePaul played better than I thought they would in that Butler game. I thought they were kind of unlucky to lose that, honestly. Um, JFL when David was Jones like, gets ruled out at tip, ruled and out Butler gets NC back at well. Yeah, yeah, and JFL went, what, like three of 17 from the field. I I think it's a good bounce-back spot. Uh, what do you think overall here, Micah? Yeah, same thing. Like, I, 
positive regression has got to come from. I mean, Freeman Liberty is another guy who's been playing forever. I, I forget, forgot he's at Valpo. Um, but yeah, some of the models, David Jones, you know, Jalen Terry is also dirt cheap here. I don't think he's a ceiling player or anything, but 3.2K, I think he played 30 plus minutes um, in the last one out. So if David Jones is out, I think Jalen Terry, Nick Agenda are definitely not bad plays. And then, uh, you know, I feel good because I can fade Noah Horton because I know I wasn't on him at like point whatever ownership he was the other night when he broke the slate, but no one yeah, had an awesome him. game. Um, yeah, he had a great game. And him and him and Watson are the same way, but I don't think Watson has uh, come out and had his – both those guys are only ones I would consider in their deep GPP plays just because they can. Like yeah. the other night, out of nowhere, put up just a, you know, a 28 and 18 game or something crazy like that. So the Paul side, some of the monitor, I think there's a ton of value there. Um, you play for me Liberty and you can play him with Johnson – who played well, like I said, with David Jones out the other night. But um, definitely on that side, Nick Agenda, I think, is going to be pretty cheap here too. So if Jones doesn't go, I think I think you can play some guys from the DePaul side and Providence. I don't want to play you – know, I don't want to play any of the guards. It'd just be Watson or Hortzler. And like I said, I can I can feel good about not playing Hortzler since he nuked the slate the other night. He's had two games, and I hope at least, or all yeah. the first chance to go into it. Yeah, and like Watson, he's so goddamn big, but he's such a pussy. He just like won't – grab rebounds i don't understand it he has such a low rebound rate for how fucking big he is yeah um gavin they've got this uh well ken palm's got this 72 71 um i'm with micah here i think there's a couple plays on DePaul. if jones is out i agree with terry you know he'll, he'll probably play what you know 28 to 32 minutes here at 3.2 that's a that's gonna be real good value there and uh they're going to need um, on Jenda here, you know, to to play 25 plus. He's been really good defensively, Gavin. Uh, I think they just need him on the court with how Providence, you know, just like their lineup is pretty big. I, I just think they're going to need him. Uh, and then JFL as a spend up is going to project well, you know, playing the entire game. Just a massive bounce back spot for him after he played like dog shit against uh, Butler. Uh any last words here, Gavin, before we move on? Nope. I think you guys uh, hit it pretty much. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to get to Angenda. We'll see. Horkler's is probably the fifth of those mid uh, six to seven K price forwards that I'm considering. And it's crazy to think because I don't think I've played Horkler once the last two years. And, and literally, no. I feel like every time he gets on the slate, he just shits on my chest. But uh, <laughs> Paul, I never yeah. get the Paul Freeman right. I know. Like it's I never tough, get, man. Like last, this last is year, a- I, I, swapped, I swapped Polycap. I think they were playing Marquette. I swapped Polycap out for uh, Justin Lewis. I forget who the big got ruled out. And, like, if I would have left Polycap in, like, I would have won everything. And then, of course, Justin Lewis gets, like, two fouls four minutes in. And uh, yeah. Brutal. On Genda, on Genda feels like he yeah. either double doubles or he fouls out in 11 minutes here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a tough matchup for him with Watson. I can see him easily fouling himself out. And it is Top a 12 game slate, block rate, so. but yeah. Yeah, so let's move on. We got uh, our next game here is um, on the DK. It's Florida State and NC State. We haven't seen Florida State in a while. Uh, classic tilt box, Leonard Hamilton. Uh, Gavin, what are the particulars on this game here for you? Well, we got. Uh, Total of 141, you know, we know that NC State's going to – their their tempo rate isn't as quick as you would think, but they play some high-scoring games just with how inefficient their defense is and how efficient their offense is. So 141 total, FSU laying two and a half uh, at NC State. Yeah, NC State's given up 80-plus in four straight, Micah. Um, what do you think about this Florida State rotation? I feel like, man – Every time – Gavin and I talk about this. Every time it seems like Hamilton is condensing the rotation, he just bends us over and plays nine guys 22 minutes apiece. Um, but if he does, I think Mills could be in play here. What do you think? Yeah, I think Mills, you know, the Houston transfer is definitely in play. But like you mentioned, it's just like what is he going to do? Because, like, I feel like he has the shortest leash of, like, any coach in the country – what he's going to do on a certain slate. So Mills, if he gets 30 plus minutes, yeah, he'll probably uh, be a definitely good player. It was sneaky the other night. I was looking at it. Like if you put like stack the NC state Miami game, like you would have won everything on Wednesday night. That, that game, game was nuts. Nuts. 
Um, and I think that's because, like Gavin mentioned, NC State is terribly defensively. So it's a really good matchup. Uh, you know, I only play one guy from FSU. I mean, Raekwon, this is a Raekwon, Raekwon Evans breaks a slate game all over. Not, he doesn't oh, God, well. I, hope, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I mean, it's just like you pick your poison. I know Anthony Polite's not going to or Osborne. I'd play anyone. It'd be Mills. And then, uh, you know, on the NC State side, same thing. I don't really want to attack it, but I think Sebron's another one of those guys who is basically in play on every single slate just because he's going to be out there the whole game. And Helms yeah. actually had a pretty good game on Wednesday night too, but I don't think I'm going to chase that. So um, probably only a one apiece for me. Each yeah, side. I don't think this is for DS wise. I'm too enamored for it. But um, Leonard Hamilton, you know, you never know what he's going to do. Uh, Balsa playing Balsa last year was like the most tilting thing. You could oh do. my god! Even if he would crush, like I think against Louisville or something, like he would get on the court and four, score like six points in three minutes and just get pulled. Like I know Hamilton is the tiltest guy, so I, I think maybe one from each side. But I wouldn't go crazy here. Yeah, I think Mills is in play. Probably not for a, a main team, just because you don't want to watch him play 22 minutes. Yeah. Um, on the NC State side, we saw Thomas Allen play a little more than I thought. That kind of kills Cam Hayes and hurts uh, the freshman Smith a bit more than I thought. Um, like you said, Helms is a bit too scoring dependent for me, and especially with a matchup against Florida State, that's tough. Uh, kind of tough for Sebron to fail just because his peripherals are so good. Uh, I just don't see him putting up like 40, 50 against Florida State here. Um, Gavin, what did you say the line was? Is it like four? That seems a little Two and light, a half. but oh, wow. Um, An FSU I'm not team. Betting, uh, I'm not betting Florida State again. They fucked us so many times this year. <laughs> where, where FSU loses at South Carolina. And I then know. next game beats Lipscomb on the 15th. And now Leonard Hamilton has had two weeks to whoop these kids' ass in shape. Like, they it's the ultimate spot where Florida State blows them, by, blows them out by 25. Like, yeah, oh and I think God. there's and, a better chance that Florida State wins by 20-plus than NC State wins this game. Yeah, he's going um, to to agree. Exactly 21 minutes a game from all 12 of his guys. So. Oh, yeah. It, as Gavin says, you know, uh, if Florida State gets up early, this is uh, – Leonard Hamilton's wet dream, you know, just, just <laughs> playing everyone 21 minutes a game. Yeah. Uh, with that, we will move on. Uh, next game is Mason and Kansas. Uh, Gavin, what do we got on this one? Well, we got Kansas. Feels like the fifth straight time on the slate. They're playing some blind and deaf school, um, <laughs> and they're a 20-point favorite with the highest team total by a country mile on the slate. Uh, we got a 145-and-a-half game total. Kansas laying 20. At home to one George Mason. Yeah, I actually think George Mason's pretty good. Um, I'm I might take the plus twenty. Uh, they've they played uh, like Nevada. They played decently well until they fell um, fell apart down the stretch. They they won at Maryland, I think. Um, I think Mason's a decent team, but so Micah on a twelve game slate. How do you, uh, if you do, how are you attacking a, uh, a 20 point spread here? Yeah, so this is the game I wish they would take off the slate and put uh, Louisiana Tech and Western Kentucky on, which I mean, it's never going to happen, but like that would, I love, anytime I get Kenny Lofton on slate, you'll always hear me happy. Well, you didn't play last <laughs> night, so you didn't see Kenneth Lofton pick up a foul and get teed up a minute into the game and sit the rest of the half. Yeah. Glad I did not play last night. Then. And I got a text from Gavin. He's like, this fat fuck is. Fallon <laughs> <laughs> attack, got- 90 seconds in. Hit the bench. Fallon attack. Grab oh some pine. God. <laughs> okay, all right. Run bad. So, see, this is why I'm not playing every sleep. Yeah. It happens to me. But we, we do have some good this. pricing on the Mason side. Yeah. We, we talked about this one before we came on. Like, reason DraftKings, it's not as bad they put this game on the slate, but they have no clue. Like, when they have teams that they don't have on there, like Kansas, they're just going to set it and forget it and put all these guys in their same price range, you know, for Kansas. But for George Mason, you've got Devontae Gaines, you know, 3K, Josh Agura, 3.6K, our buddy Deshaun Schwartz from uh, Colorado um, at 4.5K. So I think these guys are in play. Um, it's just like, I, I agree. George Mason, and it, Kim English is the coach for Jim, George Mason, who has been into, uh, you know, Fog Allen a couple times as a player in Missouri. So, I don't think this team is necessarily intimidated. They, they beat Maryland so far this year. So um, I, I agree. I think 20 points with them, even just a backdoor cover or something like that. Yeah, it seems heavy, right? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a, a big spread. And then Kansas in this game, you know, maybe a New Year's Eve uh, hangover or something like that. But um, on George Mason's side, I think you can get a ton of value. And uh, with Gaines and Odora, the 3K prices who are going to play, uh, I mean, Odora's taking the shot. So I think he's in play. And then Kansas, like this Christian Brown, like what he's doing this year, like I just keep, I don't fade him necessarily. I, like I've been playing, I've been like even on the field, I've been behind the, the eight ball, I'd say with him. And, uh, you know, well, he missed it. He's 8K now. <laughs> yeah, he's 8K. That's what I'm saying. Like, he's down. Exactly. Yeah. 6.6 and 6.5, I wasn't getting. And then I caught up to him when he finally gets expensive. So, and I don't get the Agbaji being eight. Like, when are they going to get him out of 8Ks? I mean, I don't think they ever will. And uh, Kansas is mostly like a stay away from me, like you said. I mean, it's it's just they're they're all priced up. They're kind of like Baylor. And so, I don't think yeah. I want to from this side. But George Mason, I think you could run a couple of these guys for sure. Yeah, I think Mason's got a couple screaming values here, like you said, Gaines and uh, Oduro. Um, Kansas, I think I would rather play someone like Brown over any of the Baylor guys, you know, up in that price range. 100%. Uh, Brown was a hero for me. What was that, Tuesday or Wednesday, Gavin, when I almost took everything down? I, I think I had second in the 222. Needed one more bucket Dude, from him. Dude, so but, consistent. Uh, Super yeah. consistent. It's he's crazy. been awesome. And, you know, he's playing the whole game. Getting a bunch of steals too, uh, which you know in DFS obviously helps. Um, Remy was in a bit of foul trouble last game after he played what like 35 minutes, Gavin, in the game before. I think that he could see 30 plus here. Remy's, I mean, seeing Remy under 7K, you know, that just lights a bulb in my head, right? Um, yeah. I, I think like that he's an awesome tournament play, right? You know, because if he doesn't foul in that last game and he plays 32 minutes, I think people will be talking about him more here at 6-7. With what's their implied total? 83. <laughs> um, it's going to be Brown. It's going to be Agbaji, and it's going to be Remy, right? Um, yeah, especially and if, if it doesn't game, happen with – Like if this game doesn't blow out and stays in that like 12 to 17-point range, like – the starters for Kansas. Which we think it will, too. Yeah, you know? and so if you script it like that, like that's how all you have to think of. And then that way, these if you think this game stays semi-close, then all those guys on George Mason, like, you know, they're just shoo-ins because you think they're going to play most of the game. And I think they will even even so. But Remy, yeah, I think he's kind of learned that kind of the same thing with Marcus Carr. Like, he can't do whatever he wants to now. Like, he did it, and he's not the best player on his team. Yeah. So I think, I think this team, Kansas team, like, come in January and, like, I think depending if they can get if they know what they're going to do with McCormick and he can play consistently, they don't have to oh my start God, out big freaking, freaking Mitch Lightfoot out there for 18 minutes a game. They're I don't playing, know. They're playing Lightfoot over Jalen Wilson. It's driving me insane. I, I don't know what Jaylen I don't know what's going on with Wilson. I know what Jalen Wilson did, but I don't know outside. Yeah. Like, self just hates the guy. Like, and yeah. that's what self does. Like, if he doesn't like you, like you are not. Yeah, gonna you're play. done. Yeah. So I mean, you got a Gavin. DUI. You didn't blank your daughter, Bill Self. Just play the <laughs> guy. Yeah, hey, hello, uh, he was he was so good last year too. It's uh, pretty yeah. annoying. Um, shits on McCormick, uh, just <laughs> brutally, miserably American psycho dismemberment style. Uh, with that, we will move on to Virginia at Syracuse. Gavin, what do we got here? Oh yes, one of the rock was this bikes, one uh, of the ones second. that didn't have a spread yet. No, this has a spread, but it just doesn't have okay. any game notes from me because uh, it's a 127 total. Um, Syracuse, Lane, uh, have been bet up from minus three to minus four. Uh, in their home park, 65 and a half implied team total. Ooh, finally, we don't have to play these goddamn guys. Thank God. Yeah, they fucked us the other night. God damn it. Oh, Joe, Joe Girard. Girard. Yeah. Oh, I can never get him right. Never. Um, Micah, <laughs> do you see anything DFS-wise in this game? Nah, um, Reese Beekman, it's funny to see him play. I used to, because I went to LSU, I used to ref him. He's from Baton Rouge. I used to ref him when he played, like, bitty ball. Like, like oh, really? Day. But, uh, yeah, that's not going to make me play him or anybody from this game. But, like I said, I'm, like, DraftKings refuses to adjust the prices on Syracuse. And, like, Jess, Jesse Edwards, like, maybe. But, I mean, I, I think Virginia teams, it's like the Georgia college football. Like, you can feel pretty good fading their entire team and whoever they're playing. Like, no one's going to break the slate from this game. I don't I don't really think so. I'm, I'm yeah, saying. I mean, on a 12-gamer, yeah. are you really going to play someone in the Virginia game? I don't know. I think you can maybe play Edwards. Uh, him and Gerard are going to project well just because they play so much. Um, 50-piece incoming. <laughs> and then uh, 
Armand Franklin's down under 5K. I think he could, you know, if you if you wanted to get a piece from Virginia, I think he's the best play from Virginia just because he's under 5K and I was going to play 30. Uh, but I'm probably not going to play anyone from this game on a 12 game. Let's just move on to uh, Wake at Miami. Wake has been awesome. Uh, I was bummed to see them drop that game at Louisville. I thought they probably should have won. Um, Gavin, what do we got here? This is a this is going to be a juicy one for DFS. Yeah, I'm glad you let me lead off because uh, I got one percent phone battery. So this is the last <laughs> game worthwhile on the slate, and uh, you might be tagging me in from the computer, but phone's about to die. But anyway, uh, we got one fifty game total. Pants off game of the slate. Miami minus one and a half at home against Wake Forest. Bet down from I believe Miami two and a half. A um, couple notes. Sam Wardenberg for Miami missed last game with COVID. I expect him out, probably uh, unless otherwise stated. Jake Laravia, 39 minutes in his return off COVID. Completely surprising. Love shocking. that. Love that. Um, dude is still under 7K in the nut matchup where Miami is missing their, I would say, probably best rebounding plus defensive big combo in Wardenberg, just given – Walker and Deng Gawk are so shit underneath. Um, <laughs> but but look, I mean, he is playing at an all ACC level. Okay, you know, I'll hold the L on that. He does have, he did get a third of all of Miami's rebounds um, last game, which I, I don't know how sustainable is that. But um, junior George Mason transfer, Jordan Miller, 37 minutes last game, five for 10 from the field, uh, four from six from three. Uh, six foot seven guy with some positional versatility, and I think has that rebounding upside with some athleticism. Uh, I think I, actually I, I wrote his note down before I even got to the uh, the salary price pricing. But here's another good kind of note: is that Wake Forest eleventh and two point field goal percentage without Wardenberg in Miami's lineup. Um, I 100 percent agree with the line movement uh, towards towards uh, Wake Forest, and I, I think Wake wins this I, game I tend, outright. I tend to think they win this outright. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to bet Wake right when we get off the show. Uh, Mike, what do you think? It looks like from pricing, I'm just looking real quick, there's at least six guys in play here from this game. Yeah, appreciate Jordan Miller. Um, after like all the Tennessee news the other night, I swapped out all my Jordan Miller, who I was pretty high on in that game for yeah. uh, Triple J on uh, Tennessee. We know how that goes. <sighs> Oh, right Jesus. here with you, brother. Right here with you. Gavin played him. I played uh, in Kamwa, who had an awesome game. I did. Too. I played a bunch of him too, but like price. Yeah. I think Jordan Miller was four, five point four, and yeah, J was like five point five. So I swapped all that. Why? Why is JJJ just standing in the corner shooting three? I don't. I don't understand. He, he like you talk about complete difference. Like also, where was Alon? Like Alonis Williams is the most improved player in the country. Like oh my sure. god, he's so like, good. Where, where was this in Oklahoma? Like I get that he was playing like. But he's just coming. He, like, he never had the ball in his hand, yeah, his hands true. there, you know. He was playing Austin Reeves took every freaking shot. Austin yeah, Reeves made that game winner for the Lakers. Uh, and I, that was nuts. I don't know. Um, so just real quick before we dive in, uh, Alondis or McGusty for you, Micah? If you had to pick one here, I they're, mean, it's just a lot, they're a lot. almost the same price. I think it's Alondis pretty easy for me. Yeah, that, it's not really a choice. Like, obviously, GPP wise, like Augusti's going to be lower owned, but Londa's here at 8.8K in this. Like, you saw what happened in the NC State game the other night. Like, this is going to be a back and forth game. This is going to be a shootout. Yeah. So, I, and same thing, Laravia, you know, playing that, that many minutes in his game back. Like, I think you play both of those guys and just soak up all the, because that's what they do. Yeah. Like, Laravia, when he's in the 7.5K, is a little tougher, but at 6.7, he's right there. Um, Jordan Miller is still cheap here. Uh, I think a GPP play here, and another guy who's been playing college basketball about eight years now is Charlie Moore. Um, oh, Cuck Moore. <laughs> cool. and, and another guy I just never get right. But, um, you know, in this uh, higher tempo game, like I don't mind him here. Um, and McGusty and Wong are going to be priced up. So I don't I don't necessarily mind them. But Alondis is the best play from this game for sure. And, and if, he'll definitely be in my main lineup. Yeah, I think uh, Alondis and LaRavia, I think you're going to want at least one of those guys in – in your lineup here um looking at that box score from the nc state miami game um was surprised to see charlie moore under 30 minutes you know he didn't have foul issues um but again like you said that's just what he does he's a yeah. he's an enigma he's gonna either score 35 or six you know 
He'll take um, Kings too. Yeah. I mean, look, um, he's, Charlie Moore is on his fourth school yeah. behind two <laughs> ISO shot creators. And Wong and, and, and uh, Gusty. Yeah. He is a sixth man at best. At best, a sixth I man think, on this team. He He's going to be hitting the portal right behind Marcus. Yeah, I think Jordan Miller is the play here from Miami. Yeah. Um, if you had to pick one for me, do you guys agree? I have faith in Anthony Walker. <sighs> you love that guy. He's <laughs> going to play – 20 minutes. He what did he do? Uh, he didn't play. He didn't play. Uh, he played 90 seconds in the first half. He stayed because of fouls. He plays. <laughs> he, he played almost the entire second minutes. half. He played that. the entire second half. And he puts up 22 points. He 4 x Oh, yeah, man. I have faith. I don't want to hear it. All right. All right. All right. He's he's definitely in play because the game's so good, right? Anyone that's going to see over 20 minutes in this game's in play. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, all right, so we got five plus guys in play there. Let's move on. K State at Oklahoma. We haven't seen Oklahoma in a while, Gavin. Yeah, for uh, for good reason. We got a uh, one twenty eight and a half uh, game total. We got Oklahoma minus eight and a half here. The uh, I guess the third worst game on the slate. Kind of what we're gonna see is a, a rock fight. You know, Porter Moser. Versus kind of the guard center Kansas State, the, I I don't know if I would use other people's money on playing these guys in DFS. Michael, what do you think? Yeah, like Oklahoma is priced up for some, like they're always priced up. None of these guys are like they're cheap. Jordan Goldwire, you know, I, I almost forgot before the season started that he was here. But uh, that's why like college basketball for me is so fun because like Marquis Marquis Noel is like my, one of my favorite players in college basketball. Like. And you saw, I think they were playing Marquette earlier this year. This dude was like yeah, Chucky from the logo. Too. And, yeah. uh, you know, but in this game against Oklahoma, like, you know, I, maybe I have a couple of GPP shares, but I think this game is mostly a stay away game. Only thing that makes me want to play. And once again, I hate that we have to remember, but like these West Coast games are getting canceled all the time. So um, there is. Yeah, these lot, later games. Yeah. So like o- Oregon and Utah, that le- late game, like I always like to play someone from the late game, but it doesn't matter if it's like this. This game necessarily Porter Mosier and <clears throat> down Oklahoma. So Marquise Noel is like a G, he's always a GPP play because he's going to chuck up about 15 shots a game. But I think you can find better matchups than uh, than him against Oklahoma. And Oklahoma, I mean, I don't I don't want anyone from their side. Yeah, I agree. I think you could play um, him or Nigel Pack in a tournament. You know, uh, on the OU side, I think you could play Gibson. You know, he's right at that 5K. He's going to play almost the whole game. He's just not going to, you know, go for 7X or something. I, yeah, I think he's a good – play. You know, yeah. he's, he's a safe play, let's say. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the game's not great. Um, so we'll move on to the last one here. And you touched on something that I was going to bring up. Uh, I'm just effing terrified of any Pac-12 game right now. These are getting canceled left and right. Gavin, um, what do you think? And uh, do we have a line yet on this game? We do. We got a 141 and a half total. So here's the, the shitty part is actually yeah, pretty good compared good to the slate. Um, Oregon lane four and a half currently. Uh, Utah just playing a couple nights ago, losing at Oregon State. Now going into Oregon on the uh, Pac-12 swing. Oregon off the uh, – I thought it was a pretty long layoff from their last game. I can't remember off the top of my head. Pepperdine on the 21st. Yeah, and uh, Utah with a quick turnaround. They played last night, right? Uh, they were a showdown uh, last night. So one day what off last going, going to Oregon, right? Yeah, this is yeah. this is a tough spot for Utah in general. What do you think about the game, Micah? Yeah, that's these Pac-12 conference games. Once you get into them, they're going to play Thursdays. Sometimes Thursday, Sunday, but most of the time Thursday, Saturday. So, yeah. Um, Man, I'd love to play him volley Nante for Oregon, but I mean, he's 6.2K. And like, that's one thing Allman does with his bigs is like, he never, like, unless he has a Jordan Bell who can, like, yeah, he doesn't like those post bigs, you know, and he's not going to play more than 20 minutes a game. So I'm going to think Nate Biddle semi projects well here just because he's dirt cheap at 3K. But I don't think, you know, he, he's a safe play, but he also, I mean, sorry, safe because he's 3K. So he's almost a free square there. But right. I mean, he also is a danger to play 10 minutes or five minutes. So, um, I like Gary A, but I mean, once again, th- this Oregon team is weird to where, like, you know, he's gotten his transfers, all that has, but this is a team that's taken 
a lot longer to gel than most of these other teams. And like I didn't like Devion Harmon is just a weird fit. Like he doesn't fit very well. And I don't, I don't think him and Richardson have gotten along well in this backcourt. And uh, yeah. Richardson's still at seven point one k. I think I think him Jacob Young is. I mean, sorry, I keep calling him Jacob uh, on on his side just because his brother plays. Oh, yeah, it is Jacob. Young. <laughs> it is Jacob. Yeah, Joe Young. Joe Young Joe. earlier in the season. <laughs> Um, then, uh, you know, Carlson is always in GPP play for Utah and then both Gag in his second stint at Utah. And I know, uh, Steve, you're going to be all over Raleigh Royster in this one. Oh yeah. Right. Big Raleigh fan. God damn him. Um, I think we have some plays in Oregon. You, Utah just gave up 88 to Oregon state last night, guys. Yeah. Um, this team's not good. The defense isn't good. I mean, how do you give up 88 to Oregon state? That team is so Oregon bad. Only like seven guys, I think. I know. Um, so Carlson fouled out last night in 24 minutes. I think he sees around 30 here if he doesn't foul. Um, kind of weird, you know. They played Anthony, Raleigh, and both got uh, tw- like 25 to 27 minutes. Gavin, they kind of they've been expanding their rotation a bit, which scares me. I think I would rather play guys on the Oregon side here. Just a tough spot for me to get to anyone on Utah. Um, St- staring at 6k uh quincy what do you think yeah it's like any given game uh altman can just shuffle around this forward rotation you know at any yeah. at any moment um it's pretty consistent with richardson Harmon, young you know playing 30 plus and here's the crappy thing is that richardson and carlson i mean are, are pretty well priced for this game uh, i'm a i'm higher on the market on carlson especially on the dfs side just given Anytime you got a guy with high usage, three point capability, and block upside that the team runs their offense through at sub seven K and a pretty good total, they just have to be interested. Um, but yeah, like you said, I mean Oregon, you know, one of those uh, God fearing states, and they may just if if somebody has the sniffles, they may just cancel the game outright. So it's it's I just know. sketchy. But is, those guys are completely in play. This is what two and a half hours after yeah. the last lock, so you're just totally bummed dude, I'm if be... something happens. I'm gonna be so hammered by that time. <laughs> um, I will say for the Oregon side, right? Like the last couple games, they've kind of tightened the rotation a bit. So you you've yep. seen Richardson, Young, Quincy, and Harmon all played 34 plus in their last game, Micah. I think if you have the stones to play, you know, guys in a Pac-12 game, I think. I think Quincy's in play at 6K. You just don't see him this this price. He's going to figure it out at some point. You know, if he's playing, if Quincy plays 34, I can almost guarantee that he pays off that 6K price tag. Um, I think he's my favorite play in this game. Um, what are your last thoughts here, Micah, on this one? Yeah, I like Richardson and GPP. I think in the 7K, there are a ton of good plays in the 6K range. So I think just a sticker shock of seeing him at 7K is probably going to put a little bit uh yeah. people off of him here and, and like you said the rotation one through four is going to get pretty static uh, and all just take a little bit longer to fix that and i, I don't think you want to play any of the bigs anyways so uh jacob young puts up a lot you know he he could put together one of these like three steel four block games that he is known for sometimes and so like he does have a bit of a ceiling like i'm a sucker for the last game of the slate so um, I, I agree with you. I like Gary uh, too, and then Harmon is just a chucker. Like I, I, I keep saying, like I, I just don't think he fits well with this Oregon team, and so um, I, I think Richardson and Gary are good plays. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's the twelve games. Uh, let's let's go through and give um, not like a core, but like your favorite play on the slate. We'll start with you, Gavin, if you're ready for one, or I can it's start if be, you're not ready. It's gotta be a duro. <laughs> gotta be. Yeah, I mean, he's going to project like for the first what, person 25 in. plus at 3-6, uh, Micah? Probably the easiest piece, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think from a, value perspective, yeah. from a value perspective, he's the best player. Like, if you're looking for, like, who's going to be the highest scoring player in the slate, I think we, we talked about in the first game, like, I think Justin Lewis in his price is, like, he's got a, a huge ceiling in this order. just took plays. my fucking play, dude. God uh, okay. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay, I'll go. But also, yeah. like, Lewis I'm is about, mine. Just, okay, <laughs> Lewis is yours. Lewis is yours. I was going to say 1B. And it's because more obvious is Alondis. I mean, I think Alondis at that price yeah. is a fantastic play um, going against uh, Miami in that one. So I definitely like him uh, just from a ceiling perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I think there, there's a – like I don't think he's put up less than like 32 
DraftKings points the whole season. So, I mean, he's A, safe, and B, he's got yeah. a huge upside. So. Like, if you watch those late games, he touches the ball more than <laughs> anyone in college basketball, I think. Yeah, he's he's involved in every play. He's a good rebounder. Um, yeah, so mine would be Lewis and then at least one of those Wake guys. I think you can play both, probably. Um, I'm going to have at least one in my lineup for sure. Um but yeah, that uh, that wraps it up. Um, thanks for joining us, Micah. I know it was like last minute, but you know we wanted to cut this before we all get drunk tonight um, and wake up and kind of one eye the lineup tomorrow. Um, why don't you plug your podcast again before we get out of here? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I should have a couple episodes up next week with college basketball getting in full swing. But it's mic'd up with Dar Dog, and like uh, Steve said, it's on uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So um, usually, um, just giving going through just like we did the games, of, and I'll have to get Steve on at some point um, to talk college basketball slate. But I'm hoping next week, with football being over and NFL semi slowing down, that we'll actually start getting decent contests. But I'm not going to hold my breath. But yeah, mic'd up with Dar Dog. Um, and it's got a Twitter account as well um, that we're just trying to build up. College football had a really great season, and then college basketball is looking to to build towards that. I'm waiting for the Mania qualifiers to start up. Uh, I'm hoping. I know this should be soon, right? Yeah, I'm hoping. That DraftKings will be like, we'll send me a, an invite just like they did at the beginning of the season. Like, what do you think we should? When do you think we should start doing a uh, qualifier? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I, I'm having PTSD. So I got knocked out of the mania last year by uh, friggin' Brad Davison's nuke game in the tournament. <laughs> you remember that, Gavin? No that fucking guy. Unbelievable. I'm I'm just like spam texting Gavin. I was like, Brad Davison has 25 points in the first half. What is going on? I, oh yeah, my I got, god. Turtle knocked me out with. I think he only beat me by like a point and a half, and he had Barcelo. It was the last game on my all right, Barcelo just and he I think who they play, Utah or Utah yeah. State was someone. And like that game was like a fifty five to like a low scoring game. Of course Barcelo is the only Yeah, Barcelo did well. Yeah. yeah, no, um I played a guy who I didn't recognize and he played like six point five K Brad Davison in the worst game on the slate and he put up like forty he he had that Gavin, that had to be his highest DFS score of his nine year career. Oh, He's been usable this year. But until, yeah, he has. until that point, oh, yes. Yeah. It, it's weird. He was less play. usable last year, that's for sure. God damn it. Yeah, it's probably really decent after 14 games. years. Yeah. I, can't even watch, I can't even watch him play. I just get pissed off watching watching him come yeah. around and post up. He hasn't tried to post up as much this year. Last year, every time down the court, he's like posting up a 6'5 guard. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gavin, any final words? And you, do you want to recap what you're looking at bet-wise, too, before we get out of here? Yeah, uh, I'm betting Wake for sure. The second I get off, I this. stay off. The, but I I did bet San Diego State minus two and a half at UNLV. That looks like it's already up to minus three. So you better hurry if you're going to bet that. I did bet Marquette minus one. Screw it, I'm going down with Shaka yeah. at home. So be it if it happens. It's a good spot. But I think that's going to be the spot. And I I want to get to DePaul, but I'm probably going to push out of it. I think uh, it's so horrible, but I think I'm going to. You're not betting to Paul. You're just wait. Um, who, no, who I'm probably you... going to be driving off the cliff with Leonard again at minus two and a half. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess we probably have to. Yeah, I need no. to get some money back from what he's done to me this year, so I might as well you know, just go all in. I think on Tuesday, the at Marquette spot is when Providence loses, by the way. I think that's, I think that's the spot to bet him. Um, I will be betting Wake. I'm going to tell Gavin on the other bets – for sure, Marquette and probably Florida State because, you know, I'm a masochist. So, um, well, thanks, guys. You know, we're uh, just over an hour here. Hope everyone has a good new year um, whenever you're listening to this. Right now, I think Bama's up, what, 12 or so? We need them to cover. That'd be nice. Um, everyone have a great new year. Thanks.